Yeah, so I'm going to talk about the, I guess, European legal, as it were, <laughs> um, and why it's missing. So missing names, as you probably all in read the title of this uh, talk, uh, is a word play. We're talking about how the links went, uh, went extinct from our cultures and our landscapes. But I'm also going to imply certain reflections on what's missing in our relationship to animals, in our relationship to landscapes. So we had a two and a half year hiatus um, in these talks, and it's probably fitting that we start the series again with an oddball like myself, who's only an amateur natural historian and a professional cultural historian. Uh, but fitting probably because it makes us pause and think about conservation as part of our culture. Not something scientists do and we then apply, but something that concerns our cultural attitudes, broadly speaking. <laughs> Good, many of you may have thought when, they, when, you, when you came here, What's he going to talk about? The links has been absent for thousands of years from this country. And even in those country, countries where it clings on, it's not really part of their cultural histories. I haven't heard of fairy tales, I haven't heard of folk songs about links and this kind of thing. And if you thought that, you're in a way right. The links has been absent from our landscapes, and it's largely absent from our cultural archives. But I'm going to tell the story about that absence. And I'm going to turn it around and I'm going to tell you a story about the links as an observer of human culture. Let's talk about these two aspects first. The links has indeed been absent from the British Isles, if you still use that term, um, but not as long as people thought. You know. Uh, it used to be a scientific consensus that it was absent for maybe 4,000 years and that it died out due to climate change. But it's been proven recently that that's not the case. The lynx lived in, uh, in Britain for much longer and died out at some point in the Middle Ages. We don't know exactly when. But it died out due to human influence. What you see here on the left-hand side is... Skull of a male lynx from northern Scotland from the third century. And what you see on the right hand side is something I can't pronounce, but I still <laughs> like it. It looks really interesting. Uh, it's a Welsh poem from the 15th century. And you have Chaliu Brush in there, which means spotted lion. And that in all likelihood refers to a lynx. And we have various incidents of, like that throughout the Middle Ages. Now, it was written in the 15th century, this poem. It doesn't mean that the poet observed the lynx in the 15th century, but it means that it was still part of cultural memory at that stage. Okay, here's Kinsey Cave in the Yorkshire Dales. A full skeleton of lynx was found there, and it dates back to the 7th century. 
Uh, so we know for sure that in the 7th century, the links still roamed parts of this country. And here we have a wonderful uh, cross slab uh, from the Inner Hebrides. You can see here in the lower right-hand corner what is in all likelihood a lynx. Okay? So these cross slabs were kind of hybrid, hybrids between Christian crosses and Pictish um, um, stone masonry. And uh, what is here depicted is a hunting scene. And that dates back to the 9th century. Again, it doesn't mean that the, that the lynx was still roaming Scotland in these parts in the 9th century, but it means it was part of cultural memory. Okay. The lynx died out across Western Europe much later, as you know, uh, but it eventually died out in most cases in the 19th century. On the left-hand side, you have a hunting scene from a French manuscript. On the right-hand side, you have a house in southern Germany. It says the last lynx were killed in 1836, and you have this kind of trophy hunting uh, prowess. So the lynx has indeed been a marginal figure in our cultural archives. What you see here, and I use that as a kind of uh, running gag throughout the lecture, is a lynx drawing in an account book of all places okay, to highlight the kind of marginality of it. But it's still a wonderful sketch, isn't it? The lynx has just eaten a squirrel, and the squirrel keeps on munching. <laughs> <laughs> As I'm sure you know, the squirrel is not a staple diet of the lynx, but yet, uh, maybe in Switzerland. Okay, so if, if you look at the links throughout classical antiquity and throughout the Middle Ages, there are two features that define the links. First is, not surprisingly, the eyesight. The links is famed for its eyesight, and it's often even thought to be able to penetrate walls and tree trunks. Okay, and the second feature is something that we probably would associate with superstition, but it was a really uh, powerful image, is the lynx has transformative energies. The lynx is able to transform a waste product of his body, the urine, into a gem. We have incidents uh, throughout classical antiquity, and we have these beautiful manuscripts, both in this case from the Bodleian Library in Oxford. See? So the Euclid turns into a gem, and here the lynx is enviously shielding the gem from human greed. Okay? And um, so this feature of the lynx is associated with a negative human quality, quality of greed and quality of envy. In the late Middle Ages, if you look at Dante's uh, Divine Comedy, the lynx features, again, in a marginal way, but I think in a very interesting way. Before Dante descends into the underworld, he's attacked by three predators. A wolf, a lion, and an animal that's called lonza in Italian. And lonza simply means speckled animal. And it could be a leopard, but it could also be a lynx. In iconography, throughout the centuries, we have both instant, um, uh, instances. So it's either figured as a lynx or it's figured as a leopard. So what do these predators stand for? They stand for negative human qualities. The wolf stands for um, lust. The lion stands for arrogance. And the speckled animal stands for the limitations of the senses. And that is something that is often uh, throughout the Middle Ages associated with the lynx. The lynx is a creature that is not capable of transcendent sentiments. It's limited by its imminence. It's limited by its senses. What happens now during the Renaissance, at the beginning of modernity, during the time of the nascent scientific revolution is that this marginal figure in our cultural archives emerges as what I would call a central observer 
of European modernizing revolutions. And the first example of that is an example that bears it in its name, the Academia di Lincini. Many of you will have heard of it. It's the first independent scientific organization, as far as we know, in the world. It was founded in Rome in 1603, and in a way it marks the beginning of the scientific revolution. So it's the academy, not of the lynx, but of the lynx-like, or the lynx-eyed. And what's interesting if you compare that to Dante 300 years ago is what make, make, made the lynx suspicious as a symbol for negative human qualities during the Middle Ages predestined it to become the very embodiment of the rising scientific method and age. And what marks it? The focus on observation, the limitation to the senses, the precision of the senses, what I call empirical sobriety. Okay? In the Middle Ages, people were suspicious of it. In the early 17th century, that was the thing to do. And the links became an emblem for that, both in the name of the academy, but also in the emblem that defined the academy. So the links highlights a paradigmatic shift during the scientific revolution, a shift from transcendence to imminence, from speculation to empiricism. The most famous member of the Academy of the links like was Galileo Galilei. And he wrote in 1612 to a new member of the Academy, either we want to penetrate the true and inner substance of natural matters speculatively, <coughs> like the ancients did, or we want to restrict ourselves to understanding specific phenomena. The former I regard as both impossible and futile. And the latter, he implies, is what the links does, is what we as links do. Okay, and here on the right hand side, you see one of the iconic publications of that phase of the scientific revolution. Galileo Galilei writes on the sunspots, okay, uh, 1613. And as you can see, Galileo Galilei Linceo, the lynx eyed. He bears the name of the lynx in his own name. And he uses the emblem of his academy to adorn the title page of his publication. So the lynx becomes an observer from the periphery, still from the periphery, but an observer of momentous changes in modernity. The lynx embodies an important impetus of early modernity the empirical gaze upon nature, and subsequently, the rise of the rationalistic worldview. Part of that rationalistic worldview is an increasing bifurcation of mind and matter, and that's the more problematic part of it that the links is also going to observe, and that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Because that rationalistic worldview increasingly turned into an attitude of instrumental reason. How can we use our reason and that kind of rationalistic approach in order to dominate nature? So what we have uh, throughout the 17th and 18th century is the Lynx rises as a kind of emblematic figure of the new scientific method. At the same time in the real world, numbers of links decrease rapidly. Okay, it's the first big phase across Western Europe of links extinctions. Links had been under pressure throughout the Middle Ages, but the real extinction events only took place between the 16th, uh, between 1600 and 1800. By 1800, the links was gone from virtually all lowlands across Western Europe. And only managed to cling on to the more mountainous regions. So why was the lynx hunted? Not surprisingly, for meat and especially fur, but also for trophy. It was 
It's a long history of the lynx being feared as a food competitor. What does the lynx eat? Mostly roe deer. A little bit of red deer, uh, younger ones, fawns, and female red deer, not so much uh, the stags, but predominantly roe deer. And what's interesting, and what you can see here on the left-hand side, is that the lynx was often seen as wolf-like, which it isn't, of course. It's a very different creature. Uh, but in cultural memory, the lines are blurred. And what you see here, on the left-hand side, you can see five lynxes engaged in a driving predation or a cursorial predation, a surreal batu of a stag red deer. So first of all, lynx very, very rarely attack stag you know, with antlers because it's too dangerous. And they never engage in a communal kind of hunt. Um, they never do engage in cursorial predation. They're ambush hunters. You know, they wait for their prey to come across and then they attack. They don't, don't go after it like a wolf. So what we're seeing is here is actually a wolf behavior done by lynx. And that kind of shows how blurred these kind of lines are. So then throughout the 19th century, that kind of fear and uh, irrational fear of the lynx translated into more and more extinction events, even in the mountainous regions. And here you have examples from, from Germany where so-called Luxsteine, the lynx stone, stones were erected to commemorate the final hunt of the lynx in a given region. Okay. On the left hand side in the Harz Mountains in central Germany, on the right hand side in the Saxonian, in Saxonian Switzerland, close to what's now the Czech border. And here you have a list of you know, the lynx dying out across the German lands. And on the right hand side you have quite an ingenious trap to capture the lynx, one of the methods of hunting the lynx. At the same time, the lynx, starting in the 19th century, but then more predominantly in the 20th century, became an object of fascination. You can see the examples of conservation movements in Portugal, Spain, Scotland, and Bavarian forest in Eastern Germany, uh, southeastern Germany, that sport the lynx as an iconic figure um, for the conservation cause. And that's related to the rewilding movement in Central Europe. Here you can see certain dates related to rewilding efforts of the lynx across Central Europe started in, in the Bavarian forest in the early 70s, and then a very strong focus in Switzerland, Slovenia, France, other parts of Germany and Austria. So the links in European modernity embodies the scientific revolution as much as its ideological ambivalence. The links embodies the rise of that, scientific revolution, but also the problems it has created. And that brings us to the Enlightenment. And as you can see here, a famous etching from the Spanish Enlightenment. And if you ask people, even art historians, they often didn't spot the lynx. The lynx is sitting here in the right-hand corner, and it's observing. Francisco de Goya's El Sueño de la Razón produce monstruos. Okay? And the ambiguity I was talking about starts with an act of translation. Okay? Because El Sueño in Spanish means both sleep and dream. And depending on which option you choose, you reach very different interpretations. The sleep of reason produces monsters, okay? So if we act irrationally, if we still believe in superstition, then we produce monsters. 
who were these kind of dangerous creatures. And that would be a typical Enlightenment motif, of course. But if you translate El Sueño as dream, the dream of reason produces monsters, that's a very different interpretation, isn't it? It means the illusion to dominate nature, the illusion to control all of nature that is associated with instrumental reason. Yeah. That produces monsters. But we know these monsters, okay? Environmental destruction, uh, precarity of the biosphere, all the macrosystemic problems we are faced with today can be seen as these monsters that were produced by the dream, the illusion of reason, okay? And that brings us to what has been described as the dialectic of dialectical enlightenment, the inherent tendency of enlightenment to set humans apart from nature and to look as, at nature as a resource, as something you can explore, as something that you can dominate. And by setting ourselves apart, we think we are autonomous, we are different. But that makes us even more dependent on nature. And I, I think we are now in this kind of historical moment where we understand, because we are pushing against boundaries on so many levels, yeah, that we are much more dependent on nature than we have thought for the past 250 years. That's precisely that kind of moment. And the links, that's my point, all the rest you know already, but the links is an observer precisely of that awareness. So the Lynx sitting here observing this person and the ambiguity that this person embodies, the dialectic of enlightenment that this body embodies, yeah, is being witnessed by the Lynx. So the Lynx becomes a medium for thinking about the difference between human reason and human imagination. And the link stands in for the ability to combine the two, mm -hmm. to live in a world, uh, relate to the world in creative ways, and at the same time exercise the human ability to reason. And it is indeed, as some of you may know, who have an art, a background in art, the links throughout the 18th century, especially in, in Spain, was a symbol for the ability to combine the two. Yeah. And for somebody like Francisco de Goya, that was a great ideal. So what we have inherited from that Enlightenment moment, from the time around 1800, is a characteristic discrepancy. We've inherited an understanding of reason as instrumental reason. That's why we exploit nature. We look at nature as a resource. All of us do. You know, even if we are at, the, at our hearts, romantics, we do look at nature as a resource. And at the same time, we are also heir to an idealization of nature. That's the kind of romanticism in us. But we have not been able to really join the forces of these two. They still continue to live in us, these two traditions, in an uncomfortable way. You know? We are heir to that kind of bifurcation, to that discrepancy. And that leads us to a central paradox of our age. Nature is defined as principally mute because it's a resource. And at the same time, we want to experience nature as something that we can resonate with, and that resonates with us. So it's a kind of paradoxical situation. You know? We tell nature to be mute, to keep shut, you know? And at the same time, we want nature to speak to us. And I would describe that as the central paradox of modernity since the Enlightenment in, in a European context. And it translates today into what I would describe as the central psychological fear. And there's a beautiful quote by the German sociologist Hartmut Rosa, who reflects a lot on resonance. What forms the core of environmental concerns today is not so much the fear of losing nature as a resource, 
but rather the fear that nature may go silent as a sphere of resonance, as an autonomous counterpart able to respond to us and thus offer some kind of orientation. And my argument is that the links is precisely addressing that fear, the links in our culture, in our contemporary culture. So why has the links become the mascot of the modern conservation movement in Central Europe? First, because it embodies the dialectic of these culturally shaped relations to nature, that kind of discrepancy I was talking about. But it also can cohabitate with us in densely populated anthropogenic environments. It's different from the wolf. The wolf is a more complicated case. You know, lynx can indeed cohabitate if we let him or her. <laughs> The lynx is elusive, that means it embodies the mystery of nature, and at the same time it's familiar, it's a feline creature. It embodies the human desire for resonance with nature through a charismatic feline. So the lynx comes back into our forests, into our mountains in Central Europe. On the right-hand side, a leaflet from Austria. And this leaflet is, of course, inspired by one of the most iconic paintings from German Romanticism, Caspar David Friedrich's Der Wander über den Nebelmeer, the wanderer above the mist of sea, uh, the sea of mist, rather. And I think there's a reason why this leaflet harkens back to Caspar David Friedrich. And the reason has to do with resonance. The belief is as soon as we reintroduce the links into this kind of landscape that is, of course, shaped by humans to a certain degree, you know, we will turn into this kind of landscape, a landscape of resonance, a landscape that speaks back to us. You know? we, have, we have told that landscape to keep shut for a long time. We reintroduce the links and the hope is that it will speak back to us. And I think that is the kind of hope that is expressed in in a simple kind of advertisement iconography like this one. The links also acts as a, what I would call a mystagogue, a leader, a guide into the mystery. And that's why national parks like it so much. You, know, you can tell children about the links. You can tell about the rewilding of a landscape by saying, once you introduce the links, uh, the landscape will magically rewild. I wish it was like that, but a little, sometimes it does help, yes? Um, but that kind of idea of a mystagogue, you know, uh, in, in classical antiquity, a mystagogue is a priest or a priestess who leads into a sacrosanct territory. The links act a little bit like that for you know, um, conservation movements and national parks <laughs> in particular. Also in Britain, you know, as you can tell here from rewilding Britain, uh, what's the most important creature in this image? Of course, the lynx. Whom has it killed? Of course, a fox. You know, we have an abundance of foxes, of course, and the lynx is all about redressing balance, ecological equilibrium, or what we perceive as ecological equilibrium. So an image like that is kind of interesting in our context. Uh, yeah, that's how we want in Britain imagines future landscapes, rewilded landscapes. Yeah, and the leading figure here is clearly the lynx, the mystagogue. So here's a definition of rewilding by uh, rewilding Britain. The large-scale restoration of ecosystems to the point where nature is allowed to take care of itself. Rewilding seeks to reinstate natural processes and, where appropriate, missing species, allowing them to shape the landscape and the habitats within. So we need these creatures as Mr. Rocks. We need the links to lead the way. And I think there's a powerful story in that. You know, we may discard it as naivety sometimes, but I think there is something to that because I think we can only re rewild our landscapes <coughs> if we are able to let go of our attitude as control freaks. We have 
engaged in being controlled fruits of all our environments for far too long. And we are now sensing the really problematic, uh, precarious effects of that. If you don't put some trust in agents out there in the landscape, natural agents, we won't be able to address the deep-seated environmental problem of our age, I'm convinced. So the lynx can be one of these kind of creatures that helps us. And letting go of our control freak nature implies that we have to become more philosophical about life, to trust other forms of life more. Um, so that's the kind of philosophical ramification I find important. And part of that ability to let go is the ability to tolerate ambivalence. And that brings me to my last point, Claude levi Stoss. Probably not the kind of person you would have associated with this kind of lecture, but he wrote a really powerful book in the early 90s. And he wrote it as an ethnographer, as an anthropologist. It's a study, an academic study, comparative study of mythology, particularly of the North Pacific cultures, which is now Canada, you know, First Nation cultures. But it was written in the early 90s. It was written a year before uh, the 500th anniversary of Columbus's crossing of the Atlantic was celebrated with a lot of pomp and circumstance in many countries, in particular in Spain and France. And you can also read the story of the Lynx as a response to that, as a cultural critique. What is it about? The story of the links by Lady Source studies various mythology across North America that focus on the North Pacific and the Great Lakes. And what emerges is that these mythologies are obsessed with twin figures. The most important twin couple is the lynx and the coyote. Now what's special, according to Lady Stoltz about these links, coyote twins, is they are diazygotic. Is that how you pronounce it in English? Diazygotic, okay? So they're unequal twins. They're not enzygotic, okay? And the whole point, the whole function they have in these mythologies is to maintain that difference. Not to become equal, but to maintain the difference. Because, and that's really sources interpretation, that preserves culture, that keeps culture going. So the difference is what keeps culture going, not the sameness. Alterity, not identity. And he compares it to Indo-European mythologies. And he reaches the conclusion most Indo-European mythologies are enzymatic, have enzymatic twins as heroes. And he draws conclusions from that. He says, you know, what I can see from these mythologies is cultural technique, cultural competence of practicing difference. And what I see in European cultures is the cultural technique, the cultural practice of denying difference. And that's how he explains the cultural clash that Columbus arrived in, in, in North America and Canada. Um, so he turns this academic study into a scathing cultural critique. And the Lynx is the most important agent in that cultural critique. So the American Lynx looking across the pond as part of the twin couple criticizes the inability to embrace ambivalence as a productive element of culture and a productive element of life in general. So what you see here has become a bit of an iconic image in rewilding efforts across Central Europe. It's taken by a French photographer, Laurent Gassin, and it shows 
the rewilded lynx in the, the Swiss Jura Mountains. What you see in the background is Geneva. Okay. Now you can rejoice about this image because the lynx has returned. But it's also a deeply saddening image, I think, because I don't see life in this lynx. For me, it's a dead lynx. It's so veiled. It looks like a lynx in a diorama rather than a lynx roaming freely. And that's one of the kind of deep contradictions of rewilding ethics we're faced with. Once you want to rewild, rewild a creature, you have to survey it. And we have to ponder and work through that kind of contradiction. Uh, we need some of that surveillance in order to make sure that it works, in order to uh, get the kind of public support we need for it. But at the same time, there's something deeply problematic about it. Because we encage it again. We let it roam, and then we encage it again in our images. <coughs> So that's the fate of the limbs and the creatures we may want to rewild in the prophecy in our human-dominated age. The question it throws up, an image like that throws up, is are we arresting the links in the worldview of our gadgets, or do we accept the links as co-creators of our future landscapes and of a biosphere that we are prepared to share with non-human creatures. And a preliminary answer to that, it may sound too philosophical, too diffuse in general to you, but I, I hope you will take that away from this lecture and think about it, is we can only rewild the lynx and other creatures successfully, our landscapes successfully, if we are prepared to expose ourselves to our own wildness. There has to be a match. If we are not able to let loose of this attitude of control states. We can't bring the links back. You know, it will die out again. Because we can't live in a landscape that's dominated by control states. Um, good. A lot of the research I've done on this topic it's been translated into a book that will come out this month in German. So I encourage you know, all of you <laughs> to exercise your high school knowledge of German or your <laughs> whatever you have in German. It's worth it. You, know? you can also take lectures and uh, seminars in our School of Modern Languages in, in German. That will help you with reading. But hopefully you'll find the state for it. And I'm in touch with English publishers who will hopefully bring that. <laughs> 